the fool hath said in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They have done abominable works. There is none that doeth good. Cultures around the world give an age of the earth that confirms what the Bible teaches. Cultures throughout the world would have kept a track of history as well. From a biblical perspective, we would expect the dates given for creation of the earth to align more closely to the biblical date than billions of years. This is expected since everyone was descended from Noah and scattered from the Tower of Babel. Another expectation is that there should be some discrepancies about the age of the earth among people as they scattered throughout the world, taking their uninspired records or oral history to different parts of the globe. If man has evolved slowly over millions of years and just began to kind of drag his knuckles and walk upright, you know, 250,000 years ago and then he learned to kind of make some primitive tools and they've got this scenario about how we developed all of a sudden it appears that 4,400 years ago all over the world man suddenly became extremely sophisticated and intelligent because you look around the world and you can see these very bright civilizations like the Egyptians built the pyramids when do these civilizations date back? None of them dates back any more than 4,000 years ago. I'm talking about the written history, the great archaeological sites. You look at these civilizations of Central America, North America, South America. You go and you look at the temples in um, Indonesia and Burma, and there was obvious great intelligence and engineering skill. It's amazing, this civilization, they don't know. All over the world there's these mysteries. This great intelligence seems to blossom. Young Analytical Concordance of the Bible lists William Hale's accumulation of dates of creation from many cultures, and in most cases, Hale says which authority gave the date. But some of you may be questioning the Egyptian timeline that we've been taught of. There are really basic, uh, basically four geological periods. You can divide those into the creation, the pre-flood world lasting about 1600 years from the creation, the flood lasting about 380 days, not just 40 days and 40 nights of rain, and then the period we call the post-flood period, which really includes today. That's how compact time is in the scripture. It's not very long. And uh, I don't believe the earth has a very long time left. It's not a very long time. Evolutionists will drag the time out. And so millions of years and hundreds of millions of years are almost impossible to imagine and to think about and life seems to just go on and on and on. Okay, so what does all this have to do with Egyptian chronology and the Bible? Well, first of all, Egyptian chronology is the gold standard of chronology today. It is the gold standard. Secular Egyptologists tell us that the first dynasty of Egypt began in 3150 BC and its pre-dynastic period goes back to 5000 BC does anybody see anything wrong with that? You don't need to answer that, but think through that question. Do you see anything wrong with that proposed timeline? Well, <clears throat> the scriptures tell us this. The creation was about 4,000 B.C., the flood about 2344 B.C., the Tower of Babel incident about 2244 B.C., and the earliest Egyptian civilization then would have come sometime uh, after 2244 BC. This is a difference of about 900 years. Now, 900 years may not seem like a long time in the general scheme of things, but according to this timeline, Egypt existed 
before the flood. I don't know if that causes you any problems, but it causes me a lot of problems. <laughs> if if the, the chronologies and genealogies in Genesis mean anything, then we have got a real problem if Egyptology is correct. Why do we have this conflict between Egyptian chronology, which is the gold standard of chronologies? Why do we have the conflict with that and the biblical version? Well, today's accepted view of Egyptian chronology claims the support of archaeological evidence. Now, our modern view of archaeology really has come from three sources. I want to address those tonight. The first source is this, the Enlightenment. Archaeology is actually a new kid on the block. Uh, it came after evolutionary geology. It came after evolutionary biology. And uh, so it was influenced by the developments that were taking place, and primarily through the Enlightenment. Now, for some of you who need to go back and kind of rethink your grade school your education here, let's discuss that for a minute. What was the Enlightenment? Well, it was the view, uh, principally in the 17 and 1800s, that only what could be formulated and verified by man is valid science, and therefore it's only the science that makes relevant history. So that's basically the Enlightenment view. Uh, the opposite orthodox view is that only God can reveal the past and that biblical revelation is the key to the past history of the earth. Now, <clears throat> during the Enlightenment, the scriptures were rejected as authoritative and therefore they were inconsequential and they're treated that way even today. There is a modern bias in Egyptian chronology and that is this. The Bible is false or irrelevant, and by extension, so is the creation story, the global flood, and most of Israel's history. That is the bias in modern archaeology, and that's what you see in the major publications and in the major archaeological books. Other ancient sources are more reliable sources, and so they rarely look to the Bible for real answers anymore in modern archaeology. Now, if you can recall in my prior videos, I spoke on the Enlightenment era, and I wanted you to remember that word, Enlightenment. And the Enlightenment era followed the Renaissance era when so much had been restored or renewed. And I hope to go a little more into the Renaissance era in some later videos. Now, Although years may vary on various timelines, the primary century of the Enlightenment was the 18th century or the 1700s. This was the age of enlightenment, which was, as quoted at Wikipedia, an intellectual and philosophical movement which dominated the world of ideas in Europe during the 18th century, the century of philosophy. And it was marked by an emphasis on the scientific method and reductionism, along with increased questioning of religious orthodoxy. And the ideas of the Enlightenment undermined the authority of the monarchy and the church, paving the way for the political revolutions of the 18th and 19th century. Now, the Enlightenment era was a time period in which the separating of church and state was promoted. In the Scottish Enlightenment, Scotland's major cities created an intellectual infrastructure of mutually supporting institutions such as universities, museums, and Masonic lodges. And remember, the fathers of modern geology, James Hutton and Charles Lyell, were of Scotland. James Hutton belonged to one of the oldest Masonic lodges in the world. And let's examine the word enlightenment. It is the action of enlightening or the state of being enlightened. The Eurocentric elite scientists, philosophers, and intellectuals of this era saw themselves to be enlightened or the enlightened ones or the illuminated ones 
the bearers of light and not the light bearers spoken of in the Bible at Matthew 5, 15 and 16, but more in relation to Gnostic or Luciferian doctrine, whether literally or figuratively in opposition to the Messiah and the teachings of the Messiah. Consider the Genesis account of Adam and Eve and when they had first committed sin, falling from perfection, when they first ate of the fruit that the Most High, the Creator, had forbid them to eat from the tree of knowledge. Now, Satan the serpent, he told Eve, deceived Eve into believing that if she ate of the forbidden fruit from the tree of knowledge, her eyes would be open and she would be as God being able to govern herself. And he also told her that she would not die. Although the Most High, the Creator, her Creator told her that from the day that she ate of the fruit, she would die. But the serpent deceived Eve in telling her that she would not die and that actually her eyes would be open and she would be as God. And he's telling her this as if the Most High was actually lying to her and just trying to keep something hidden from her, something that he didn't want her to know. And the quote, knowledge is power, it originated with the English philosopher Francis Bacon. And notice how a fruit or an apple is used as a symbol of education or knowledge. Now, why is that? Is it a coincidence that many Masonic lodges, as well as the Illuminati, was established during the era of enlightenment? The Order of the Illuminati was established in 1776 by a German, perhaps of Jewish origin, by the name of Adam Weishaupt, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. And is it also a coincidence that 1776 is the official year that the United States became a nation when the Declaration of Independence was issued. This is just something to think about. This was all during the Age of Enlightenment. Now, some of you may recognize these guys. This is, these are their class pictures here. You have Newton and you have Kepler and you have Galileo. We've all heard of these guys. Well, these guys were really wackos because they were brilliant scientists who believed and taught that the Earth was about 6,000 years old and that there had been a global catastrophic flood to explain the various fossil layers. Now, this is what was actually believed before the Enlightenment really came into full swing. Let me show you another device here. This is a chart, so I've got just the first five events listed on this chart uh, that this source talks about. Does anybody know where this chart came from? You see up there dates and uh, year of the world. The creation of the world was year zero, 4,000, seven years before Christ. Now, you wonder, some of you are probably thinking, oh yeah, this is that quack Bishop Usher. Well, this is very interesting, and I'm sure you'll be surprised. This really came from Encyclopedia Britannica of 1771. Now, do any of you have this on your, your shelf? <laughs> the Britannica that I grew up certainly does not have this reference in it at all. But this is what the public believed in the late 1700s. So we can see right away that the Enlightenment was primarily begun by a group of elite thinkers that really gained respectability by being churchmen. Most of them were, belonged to some sort of church. You couldn't be really a part of society without belonging to a church. And uh, so a lot of these guys were 
uh, regular churchgoers, and they gave to the church and so on. Secretly, they thought that the church was irrelevant and that the Bible was full of myths. Anyway, the, this article in the encyclopedia goes on to talk about that uh, the flood, or the deluge, as it was called, was the most significant event in these Earth history events. And it is. The global flood of Noah is the pivotal point of Earth history. If you can solve the issue of the flood, guess what? The age of the Earth is a moot point. Because all those layers that geologists tell us are millions and hundreds of millions of years old were laid down by the flood. So it's the pivotal point of Earth history. And uh, it greatly uh, influenced the early, uh, early believers, early people. The Enlightenment really brought about a shift in the way man looked at the world around him. Now, there's a link here to geology. Archaeology has its roots in modern geology. This is James Hutton, the father of modern geology. And uh, he did teach that the Bible was not to be considered in anything pertaining to science, that only a natural view of the earth would be acceptable. Another fellow who came along after him was born in the year that Hutton died, so they didn't know each other, it was Charles Lyell. He took Lyell's ideas and kind of simplified them. Lyell was a brilliant <clears throat> attorney, <clears throat> and uh, he came up with a phrase called the present is the key to the past. Isn't that easy? You probably already remember it. The present is the key to the past. Well, that's in conflict be, with us as believers because we say, no, wait a minute, the scripture is the key to the past because I was not there. But Lyell's personal goal, and I did not learn this when I studied Lyell in, in freshman geology, his personal goal was to eliminate any reference to Genesis in geology. Now that sounds like a very open-minded kind of guy, but that was his goal. Now, Lyell is credited, by the way, by the scientific community with having dealt the death blow to catastrophism and the global flood. And uh, he advocated an earth that was perhaps several hundred million years old, and uh, essentially then the biblical flood was out. His book there, Principles of Geology, is still in print today and is still used in college classes. And it was published in three volumes in the uh, 1830s. And it's still in print today. It shows you what an influence and what an impact he had on scientific thinking. Now, the next fellow was, uh, that we're concerned about here was Charles Darwin. He was a product of the Enlightenment. And it was Darwin's ideas about evolution from simple to complex that taught a developing view of mankind from tree dwellers to great civilizations like Egypt and uh, to modern man. Essentially what he did was then uh, say that the biblical creation was out. And there's his book on the origin of species, again, still in publication. So we've got some building blocks that we want to put together here that all have led up to Egyptian chronology. The first one, of course, is the biblical history is too short, said Hutton. Uh, there must be an ancient prehistory. And then the Enlightenment taught the discovery of this prehistory must be by men of science, not by scripture, not by holy men, and certainly not by the church. And the prehistory must be interpreted by uniformitarianism, a new kind of science, they said, the present is the key to the past. And uh, then secular geology eliminated the biblical flood. And then secular biology eliminated the biblical creation. And finally, secular archaeology eliminated the biblical chronology. So it's all stacked together and it's all related to one another. I hope you can see that. Now, here has been the effect on archaeology. I have this book on my shelf, Archaeology of the Land of the Bible. In it, it says David and Solomon are portrayed in the Bible as two of the greatest kings of the ancient world. Yet within the conventional chronology, that is the one that's accepted today, 
a suitable context for their reigns cannot be found. Here's another famous archaeologist, uh, Donald Redford. Such topics as the foreign policy of David and Solomon, Solomon's trade in horses or his marriage to Pharaoh's daughter, must remain themes for midrash and fictional treatment. In Search of Ancient Israel, Philip Davies, the evidence shows the impossibility of a Davidic empire administered from Jerusalem. Well, that pretty much wipes out any kind of proof for Jesus as the son of David, Jesus as the son of Abraham, and Jesus as the second Adam. If you cannot establish the genealogy and the chronology of the son of man, the son of David, and the son of Abraham, you have no Messiah, and consequently you have no Savior. So, does the archaeological evidence really prove the Bible to be in error? Well, most archaeologists today would say yes. And of course, this impacts us as believers. And for a lot of believers, this is devastating to personal faith. Whether or not historical documents and writings contain some characters or stories that we believe are mythical, we still take into account the recorded history and the culture or the people who wrote and documented these stories and records of history, chronology, and lineage. For the most part, we believe that the people of that culture and that time period recorded by the people of that culture and that time period had actually existed. Despite the written story of Horus, Osiris, and Isis, whom many people believe are mythical Egyptian characters, People do not doubt that the pharaohs, scribes, etc., who are also documented in these ancient Egyptian writings and hieroglyphs had actually existed. They don't doubt the recorded lineage or ancestry that's given, and they believe that this information should be considered as a part of human history. Now, of course, ancient documentation of Egyptian culture, history, and ancestry is easier to accept as factual documentation, being that we have a lot of proof, like with the Egyptian tombs and mummies. But there are a lot of historical figures whose burial places are still a mystery, yet we don't doubt these people actually existed. Alexander the Greek is one of them. So why would we doubt the chronology and ancestry documented in the Holy Scriptures or the Bible? I mean, even if we don't see these books as being holy, why would we think that everything written in the Dead Sea Scrolls or the Apocrypha is just all a part of this big fairy tale? I mean, look in the book of First Chronicles in the Bible. And this person begat that person, and that person begat this person, and it goes on and on. I mean, do you honestly believe that a person, a writer, would go through this much in giving this much detail to give you a fairy tale or something that's just fictional? And you'll find these lineage listings all in the Bible. And there is secular proof that some of these persons mentioned in the Bible had actually existed. And the Bible mentions persons who are taught about in secular history who we are taught to have actually existed. So why would you doubt that Abraham or King David or the one who many of us refer to today as Jesus had actually existed. Now, there are dissenters out there. This is an archaeologist by the name of David Downs. He said most archaeologists realize the Egyptian chronology has problems which they'd rather pass over. Well, here's the legitimate question. Could it be that archaeologists have an abundance of evidence but have put it in the wrong time frame? The second source for Egyptian chronology actually came from a monumental mistake. Well, how's that? Some of you may recognize this guy. His name was uh, Champollion. He is regarded as the father of Egyptology. He's the one that took the Rosetta Stone 
Napoleon found this thing when he invaded Egypt and he had Champollion translate it. And Champollion discovered the key to the hieroglyphs. Before this time, no one understood anything about the hieroglyphs. And uh, Champollion unlocked that mystery. He was a brilliant linguist and was highly regarded all over the world. But here's the problem. In 1822, he mistranslated an Egyptian inscription and consequently misidentified Pharaoh Sheshonk I with the biblical Pharaoh Shishak in 2 Chronicles chapter 12. Now that's a huge mistake if you understand that there's some time involved here. This is not just a misspelling on some Egyptian tablet somewhere. This is a mis identification and a misinterpretation. The translation by the brilliant Champollion has become the cornerstone of Egyptian chronology. Now some Egyptologists are beginning to question this. Here's one, uh, David Roll in Egyptology said that Champollion's mistake had been correctly translated by 1888. This is 60 years later. However, the misidentification of Shishak with Sheshonk was not overturned and has remained the cornerstone of ancient chronology. So we've got a problem and we have to resolve that. Now, he concludes that the Egyptian chronology has remained several hundred years off since then and it has influenced everything. If we revise the chronology and we adjusted for Champollion's mistake, what we'd end up with is most likely Ramses II, really, as the pharaoh Shishak. You remember it was Shishak who invaded Jerusalem during the time of Rehoboam and ransacked the temple. And uh, it would have taken a very powerful king to do that, and Ramses certainly was. This was during the time of King Rehoboam, the son of Solomon. Now, the third source of modern Egyptology, modern Egyptian chronology, is the reliance on particularly one outside source of information. And uh, if you look far enough, you'll see that Champollion relied on a king list compiled by this guy named Manito. He was an Egyptian priest under Ptolemy who attempted to compile a list of Egyptian kings. Up through Champollion, Manito was considered to be the only authoritative standard. Well, here's some problems that have been discovered along the way. First of all, some of the names cannot be found in history. Well, that's a kind of a problem. If I tell you, and I am, I'm related to William the Conqueror, my mother has done all of the genealogical work, but if I told you I was related to William the Conqueror and there were, there were several names missing from the list, you would say, wait a minute, you better go back to work. You've got to be able to establish a proper genealogy. Well, some of the names are not found in history. Number two, some of the pharaohs are duplicated because they have different names. When you study the Book of Kings, you find this out. Some of the kings went by different names. The same king, but different names. Uh, <clears throat> we do that today, I think, with Jimmy and James. Pat and Patrick, uh, you know, there are all these different names, and we're used to these names, but back then, uh, you, you look at names in the Bible today, and you see one name, and then you see him pronounced a different way, or a different name applied to the same person, you have questions about it. Well, <clears throat> these, some of these pharaohs uh, were duplicated, because Manito failed to take that into uh, account. Uh, he does not account for pharaohs who ruled at the same time. So that would upset the chronology. And finally, he does not account for father and son who ruled at the same time. So, here's the big question. What if the Egyptian chronology was revised forward 800 to 1,000 years? What would the picture look like? Well, again, like I said before, I think there are several scenarios that you could construct. I'm just going to give you one set of ideas tonight. But uh, what would be the evidence for early chapters of Genesis, Joseph, and Moses? And how would Egyptian chronology line up? Well, here's a book. If you can get this book, 
I, I would get it. This is, book is by David Roll. Uh, <clears throat> I paid, at the time, when this book first came out, you know how books are, I paid 100 bucks for it. I, I wanted this book because I had seen his expose on Discovery Channel, and I thought, man, this is really critical information. If you can find this on Amazon, I would get it. Anyway, what he does in that book is he lists 40 archaeological discoveries that verify the scriptural accounts of Joseph and Moses, but have been ignored because the current Egyptian chronology has been the standard for over 200 years. Um, very, very critical. And in the beginning of the book, David Roll tells you that he is an agnostic, but he does think that biblical history is an accurate history. Isn't that interesting? And how many believers don't even believe in the historical accuracy of their Bibles? But here you have an agnostic who does. One of the first things I noticed, this phrase up here, I'm not even going to attempt to pronounce it, but it's Egyptian for the Arab Republic of Egypt. You notice one of the names in there is Miser. Now, the word Miser is from the Hebrew Mizraim. Genesis 10.6, one of the sons of Ham. In Genesis 12.10, it is translated as Egypt, where Abraham travels to Egypt. This is the first mention of Pharaoh and Egypt. Now, what I've gone through in my Old Testament is every place that it mentions Egypt, Egypt is actually a trans, it's an English transliteration of the Greek, Egypticus. But if you, I, what I have done is I've crossed it out and wrote up, Mizraim, just to remind me that Egypt has its roots in one of the grandsons of Noah, not several hundred years before the flood. So the picture looks like this. Noah, Ham, Mizraim, who founded Egypt after the Tower of Babel around 2200 BC. That's more of the picture you have. Now, if we revise the chronology, this particular fellow, Egyptian uh, history, historians call him King Menes or King Narmer. He was the first king of Egypt who established the first dynasty of Egypt. Well, his name doesn't show up in the Bible, does it? Well, here's the question. Could he have been Mizraim? Is there any corroborating resource for this? Eusebius, who is an early church historian around 300 A.D., did identify Menes as Mestrium or Mizraim. So he was following the biblical chronology. Another interesting archaeological find, in 2001, 14 wooden boats were discovered in Egypt from the first dynasty, sealed in mud brick casing and not dismantled, but buried intact. Now that's significant uh, because later pharaohs would take part they would take apart the things that they had in life, or the people that, uh, that, that uh, waited on, on the Pharaoh would take things apart and put them in the tomb with him so he could enjoy them in the afterlife. These boats were buried intact. Now that's interesting to me. The boats were around 81 feet long, so rather large boats. Naval archaeologist Cheryl Ward said she was amazed by the high degree of technical skill shown by these artifacts. Now, if we revise the chronology, here's the question. Could these be a reminder of Noah's time just 190 years before? And these boats then were buried for the afterlife just in case they were needed. The flood was a relatively recent event, would have been a relatively recent event in the life of this king. 190 years is not all that long. Well, in subsequent times, boats, of course, were dismantled and then uh, buried with the pharaoh. Uh, could these be? Noah would still have been alive during this time. Let's remember that. He was a very old man when he died. And I don't think he was inactive. What do you think he was doing in the several hundred years he lived after the flood? He was watching earth fall apart again, wasn't he? Especially man as they became... Uh, as they spread out and became evil and the idolatry increased. I don't think Noah sat around and fly-fished in Montana. I think he was busy 
trying to reach people. I think his son Shem was the same way. That's my personal belief. But he'd experienced the flood. And I don't think he would have been idle. Now, in 1922, 1934, Sir Leonard Woolley discovered Ur as the first civilization with a superior knowledge of astronomy and arithmetic. If we revise the chronology, Terah, the father of Abraham, would have been living at the time of Zoser of the third dynasty of Egypt. Kind of interesting to put some of these pieces together, isn't it? Uh, the step pyramid of Zoser, which looks like this, really could have been an influence from Mesopotamia and Ur of, the, of uh, Chaldea, a tie-in with the biblical chronology. Here's the great ziggurat of Ur. And this may have indeed influenced him. If King Zoser reigned during the lifetime of Terah, this would have been 220 years after the flood, 121 years after the Tower of Babel. Noah would have been 821 years old. Shem would have been 391 years old. And these were, would, have considered, would have been considered old, old men, but kind of interesting. What a paradox. Now, the stories of the flood and the Tower of Babel would have still been in the memory, maybe still, again, preached by Noah and Shem. Now, for those of you who are a little bit more visually oriented here, let me put this chronology on kind of a timeline. We've got um, the Tower of Babel about 100 years after the flood. That's represented by the first white line there. The second one would have been Menes, the first king of Egypt. Mizraim, Noah's grandson. And then uh, you've got about 191 years to Zoser. And then Terah and Abraham. Abraham uh, was born 290 years after the flood and 191 years after the Tower of Babel. So Noah died at age 950, 60 years after Abraham was born. So he saw a lot of life. And there was a lot happening during this time. And I'm sure he was not inactive. Here's an artist rendition of Josephus. Josephus tells us that Abraham brought arithmetic and astronomy from the Chaldeans to Egypt. Let's see what the connection might be here. If the chronology is revised, this famous king by the name of Khufu, or in the Greek Cheops, the great pyramid builder, as he was called. According to Josephus, it was Abraham who brought arithmetic and astronomy to Egypt when he went there in about 1875 BC because of a famine in the land. Now, this could have been around the time of King Khufu. And archaeologists do agree that it was during Khufu's reign that there was an explosion of astronomical and mathematical expertise the first truly mathematically correct pyramid was built during Khufu's reign. Here's what they looked like before Khufu. Couldn't quite figure out how to do it. And consequently, they were quite inferior. Now, going forward, if chronology is revised, Joseph could have lived in Egypt during the reign of Pharaoh Sesostris I. There you can see a statue of him. Sesostris I was known to have had a vizier or a prime minister named Mentuhotep, who had exceptional ruling power. One archaeologist noticed this. Mentuhotep appears as the alter ego of the king. When he arrived, the great personages bowed down before him at the outer door of the royal palace. And of course, that's what we read in Genesis. Joseph had incredible power. So you see, begin to see things begin to line up if we start correcting a few of the mistakes that have been made. But the views of the Enlightenment just will not let us do that. It's anti-biblical. Here's a very interesting fellow. I'm sure you've heard of him, Flinders Petrie. Uh, he was a Plymouth Brethren. Now, that's somewhat of my background. I was, of course, I was brought up as a Catholic, and when I uh, became a believer... The people that really had influence in my life early on were Plymouth Brethren. 
these, uh, this, this was kind of a back to the Bible movement in the late 1800s. And they're very strong believers and very strong in the scriptures. Uh, anyway, this fellow was famous for developing the system of dating layers based on pottery and ceramic findings that's still used today. He's the one who, among other things, discovered evidence for the slaughter of the Israelite babies in Egypt. Located in the Manchester Museum uh, is a box, and uh, what Petri discovered were many such boxes like this that uh, were in underground underneath the area known to have been occupied by the Israelites. Uh, they contained skeletons of babies up to three months old, sometimes three in a box. And uh, he thought they were probably the bones of the Israelite babies who were killed on Pharaoh's orders. So this seemingly insignificant find now becomes significant, but only if the chronology is revised. Other than that, it's just kind of an interesting Egyptian find. Now, the scriptures tell us that a new king arose over Egypt who did not know Joseph. These look like a couple of unsavory characters here called Sesostris III and Sesostris II. Now, there is confirmation of Israelite slaves in Egypt during the reign of Sesostris III. He was one of the pharaohs of the oppression, and uh, you can see his face. I, just, I don't think I'd like to run into this character, but one of his slogans was, aggression is valor, retreat is cowardice. Now, this is what molded his life. So, obviously, he's going to have a different view of life than most Egyptians had, and certainly most people today have. Now, if we continue to revise the chronology, another interesting pharaoh shows up, Amenemhet III, also of the oppression of the Israelites. I want you to notice something about this pyramid. It doesn't look much like a pyramid anymore, and it's because they weren't building them of stone. This is a mud brick pyramid during the 12th dynasty. In the revised chronology, the 12th dynasty would have been the time of the oppression of the Israelites. All the pyramids were built of mud and straw during this time, not stone. Isn't that an interesting coincidence? Now, Amenemhet III had a daughter named Sobekneferu. Now, Josephus tells us that she was childless and that she was the adopted mother of Moses. Interesting connection. Very interesting. That would have been... Amenemhet IV, obviously the uh, pharaoh Amenemhet III died childless. He, did, he didn't have any children, natural children. So Amenemhet IV became the adopted son of Sobek Neferu, an adopted successor to Amenemhet III. Now, Amenemhet IV is a real mystery. He seems to have just disappeared from history without any explanation. So the question is, could he really be the Moses that disappeared from Egypt? Amenemhet III reigned for 46 years and he left no heir. If Moses was Amenemhet IV, he left Egypt around 40 years of age. So there's kind of a vacuum here and it most likely would have been filled by, at least temporarily, by Sobek Neferu. And um, then, abruptly, the 12th dynasty of e Egypt ends. Nothing of Amenemhet IV's disappearance has been recorded anywhere that we know of in Egyptian history. Was this really because Moses had fled Egypt? And that's, a, I think, a legitimate question to ask. Now, moving forward again, if we revise the chronology, this is Pharaoh Neferhotep, there's evidence of the exodus. He is a pharaoh of the 13th dynasty and uh, a pharaoh considered to be one of the candidates for the pharaoh of the exodus. His mummy has never been found. Now to some that may not be mean much because there are a lot of pharaohs that haven't been found but I think when we start adjusting the chronology all of a sudden this is a coincidence that maybe makes sense. 
It was during his reign that the Israelite slaves suddenly disappeared from Egypt and the mysterious Hyksos suddenly took over in Egypt. You wonder why, if Egypt was such a powerful country, did these people, the Hyksos, come into Egypt, take over and establish the reign until another pharaoh drove them out. There was a power vacuum of some kind that took place in Egypt. Now, could it be that Neferhotep I, could it be that he's at the bottom of the Red Sea? Maybe that's why we don't find his tomb. Could the sudden departure of the slaves be Israel's exodus? Could the Hyksos actually be the Amalekites that Moses ran into on his way into the Promised Land? That actually happened. If you read the book of Numbers, he passed by a, a people that were moving toward Egypt. They were headed toward the Promised Land. And uh, I think because of Neferhotep's death and the loss of his army, there probably could have been a power vacuum created and the Amalekites knew it. Maybe they were the mysterious Hyksos. Now, there is evidence of plagues in Egypt. This particular document here is a papyrus in the Leiden Museum in Holland, and it names pretty much all of the plagues that uh, the Bible names. There's also the issue of Neferhotep's son, Waneferhotep. He did not succeed his father on the throne. This is his coffin. He died as a very young boy. Was he the firstborn son who died by the last plague? Do you see how things begin to line up? Very well could be. The Israelites, we are told, were to eat the Passover in haste. They were to eat it with staff in hand, fully clothed, leave nothing over till the morning, and take off. No signing of wills, no cashing in on investments. They were just to get out of there. Now, very interesting statement by an archaeologist. She said this, It is evident that the, uh, the completion of the king's pyramid was not the reason why Cahoon's inhabitants eventually deserted the town, abandoning their tools and other possessions in the shops and houses. The quantity, range, and type of articles of everyday use which were left behind in the houses may suggest that the departure was sudden and unpremeditated. That sounds like eat the Passover in haste to me. Well, here's the conclusion that David Downs, the, uh, the archaeologist, makes. Back to about 700 B.C., there is agreement between the history of Egypt and the biblical records. But earlier than that, there are serious discrepancies. And of course, this is where the major genealogies and chronologies are found, isn't it? And again, the devil knows this better than we do. I don't think sometimes we really grasp the importance of this. Jesus was the son of David, the son of Abraham, the son of man, the second Adam. If he cannot demonstrate that, we have no Messiah. Now, these discrepancies really appear to be the result of three things. Again, kind of summing up. One, the influence of the Enlightenment. There was a bias against the biblical records, and it was an unfounded bias. The Enlightenment wasn't as a result of an accumulation of scientific evidence and discoveries. It was a shift in worldview that took place. And this shift was not pro-Bible. It was anti-Bible. And it affected everything from then on. You and I are, li are living in post-Enlightenment times. We're a product of the Enlightenment. And I think that's why we have a lot of things going on in our culture today that we do. It's because the thinking slowly shifted away from a God-centered view of life. Number two, the mistaken identification of Shashank I with the Shishak from the Bible by Champollion, a mistake that has not been corrected since it was first made. And then a third discrepancy seems to be due to the reliance on Manito's faulty king list. As a result, 
all of the chronology of ancient Egypt is off by as much as 800 to 1,000 years. David Down again notes this, the scribes of Israel were meticulous in copying their sacred writings. When a reduced chronology of Egypt is adapted, remarkable agreement can be found between Egypt and Israel. And many Egyptian characters, unnamed in the Bible, can be identified with known Egyptians. So, we get to the question here about Egyptian chronology in the Bible, which is the correct standard. We should always opt as believers in the scriptures. If we claim to hold the scriptures as God's word, we should all adopt the view that Jesus had. Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Somewhere along the line, if there's a discrepancy, man has made the mistake. Somewhere. Otherwise, our God is no greater than our imagination, and the Bible is no greater than any other holy book. And those are some things we have to reconcile. Although we have a lot of Kemetic teachers today, and we know that the ancient people of Kemet were what we anthropologically refer to as black people today, who were the founders or original teachers of what we know today as Egyptology, or Egyptology in more modern times. These were not Afrocentrists, but Eurocentrists. And I am going to use much of the information considered to be factual that is presented by the Caucasian European descendants to debunk the lies and misinformation presented by their brethren. Because you need to see the contradiction which will help you to decipher the lies from the facts and the facts from the truth. And these Eurocentrists have misinterpreted much of the Kemetic historical information and hieroglyph translations. Like Horus was taken from the Babylonian trinity of Nimrod. Nimrod the Cushite, who is mentioned in the Bible, along with Tammuz. The Babylonian trinity, it represents Nimrod, Semiramis, and Tammuz who were of Hamitic descent, just as the Egyptians were of Hamitic descent. And when you consider Catholicism and Christendom, which has fused the Holy Scriptures with pagan traditions, but I hope to get more specifically into that in a later video. But I want you to understand the mindset and the idealisms of the elite leaders, philosophers, writers, and scientists of the Enlightenment era so that you can have a better understanding of their agenda, which is actually a Luciferian agenda masked as atheism and humanism. But you see, they have just given you, the masses, the exoteric knowledge while they believe that they possess the esoteric or hidden knowledge and understand that another meaning for occult is hidden. You're a fool if you believe that these people were all atheists or humanists who followed the scientific method, having no sort of religious beliefs or beliefs in what is considered the supernatural. You see, the question is, what religion did they actually follow? And what or who represented the supernatural? 